In this video, we're going to take a look at an example, SAT verbal scores. Do students who learned English and another language simultaneously score worse on the SAT critical reading exam than the general population of test takers? The mean score among all test takers on the SAT critical reading exam is 501. A random sample of 100 test takers who learned English and another language simultaneously had a mean SAT critical reading score of 485 with a standard deviation of 116. Do these results suggest that students who learn English as well as another language simultaneously score worse on the SAT critical reading exam? Use the alpha equals 0.05 level of significance. So we need to start by determining what our null and alternative hypotheses are going to be. So we need to find H0 and H1. These are going to be about mu. So what we're told here is that the mean score among all test takers on the SAT critical reading exam is 501. And we're wanting to see if students who learn English as well as another language simultaneously score worse on average. So if the average is 501, and we want to see if students who learn two languages simultaneously is worse than that, then we're going to have less than 501 as our alternative hypothesis. So what we're really saying here with the null hypothesis is that students who learn two languages simultaneously do just as well on the critical reading part of the SAT versus the students who learn two languages do worse on the critical reading part of the SAT. That's our null and our alternative hypotheses. Now next we need to choose a level of significance and the problem tells us to use a 0 0.05 level of significance so alpha equals 0 0.05. We could do either the classical approach or the p-value approach, either one. I'm going to show both. So if we use the classical approach, then in this case we have a sample size of 100. So that means we're going to have 99 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to have a t-distribution with 99 degrees of freedom. Since our alternative hypothesis is less than, we're going to be looking at the left tail. Now this area in the left tail needs to be alpha equals 0 0.05. And I need to determine this critical value. Since this is in the left tail, the critical value is going to be negative. And I can determine what that critical value is going to be either by using the inverse t command on my calculator using the t-calculator in StatCrunch, or using the t-table from the appendix of the textbook. So I'm going to use the t-table from the appendix of the textbook. This table from the appendix only gives us positive values, but by symmetry, if I use the 0.05 area in the right tail, then in the left tail it'll be the same values, they'll just be negative instead of positive. So I'm going to go down the 0.05 column until I reach 99 degrees of freedom. We've experienced this issue before. We don't have a row for 99 degrees of freedom. We just have a row for 100 degrees of freedom. So I've got to go with that. So 100 degrees of freedom gives me a critical value of 1.660. And again, because this is a left tail, this is going to be negative 1.660. Now just for the sake of it, if I had used my inverse t command on my calculator, then the area in the left tail is 0 0.05. We have 99 degrees of freedom. I would get the same value, negative 1.660. So having to use 100 degrees of freedom instead of 99 degrees of freedom from the table isn't really a problem. So now I need to calculate the test statistic. So our test statistic, T0, is equal to x bar 
minus the mu from the null hypothesis divided by s over the square root of n. And so in this case, our x bar is 485. So 485 minus 501 over s, which is 116, divided by the square root of 100, because 100 is our sample size. So again, this is our sample mean, 485, minus the mean from the null hypothesis, 501, divided by the sample standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. So if I put this in my calculator, parenthesis 485 minus 501, close parenthesis, divided by parenthesis 116 divided by the square root of 100. Close the parenthesis for the denominator. And that gives me negative 1.379. So this test statistic is negative 1.379. So if I'm using the classical approach, I would compare that negative 1.379 to my figure here, and so negative 1.379 would be to the right of negative 1.660, so that would tell me do not reject the null hypothesis. So this did not fall in the unusual area. Now if I want to use the p-value approach, Well, the p-value, since this is a left-tailed test, would be the area to the left of our test statistic. So our p-value would be this area here, which would be to the left of negative 1.379. So this would be our p-value, whatever that area is. Now again, we have a T distribution with 99 degrees of freedom. So if I want to find that area, remember I cannot really find that precisely with the table. The best I can do is kind of get a range of what that value might be. Let's go ahead and talk about that again. So the way I would do that here is I would come to my row that I needed to use, which in this case was 100 degrees of freedom, and I would look for my test statistic, 1.379, in this row. Well, 1.379 would be between 1.290 and 1.660. So if I come back up, that would be between 0.10 and 0.05. So the best I can say from the table is that my p-value would be something in between 0.05 and 0.10. 10. That's the best I can do with the table. So we don't really like doing that, especially not with technology being so handy now. So if I want to use technology for this to figure out what that p-value is, that value I can use the tcdf command to find. So I can go tcdf. Now I have a right boundary of negative 1.379. I don't really have a left boundary, so I'm going to use a big negative number. So negative 10 to the 99 to negative 1.379 and my degrees of freedom will be 99. So again it's TCDF we do left boundary, right boundary and then degrees of freedom. So if I use my calculator to do that go second distribution TCDF my left boundary is a big negative number, negative 10 to the 99. My right boundary is negative 1.379, and I have 99 degrees of freedom. So that gives me a p-value of 0 0.0855. Now, incidentally, that is between 0 0.05 and 0 0.10. So, the table tells me it's somewhere between 0.05 and 0.10. The calculator, or StatCrunch for that matter, can tell me more precisely it's 0 0.0855. Now, because 0 0.0855 is bigger than our level of significance 0 0.05, that tells me do not reject the null hypothesis. 
So whether I use the classical approach or the p-value approach, either way, I do not reject the null hypothesis. Now, if we wanted, we could have done this directly with the calculator. So once I know my null and my alternative hypotheses and I know the conditions are met to do the test, I could directly use the calculator. So I could come to stat and tests and we could do a t-test. I'm doing a t-test because I am doing a hypothesis test for a mean and so we use the t-distribution for that. So again, I can input, I either have to have data or statistics. In this case, we have statistics, we don't have data. I fill in my mean from the null hypothesis, which the calculator denotes mu naught, so that's 501 in this case. I fill in my sample mean, which is 485 in this problem. I fill in my sample standard deviation, which is 116, and I fill in my sample size, which is 100. My alternative hypothesis is less than, and calculate. So when I calculate, the calculator gives me the test statistic, which is negative 1.379. It also gives me the p-value, which is 0 0.0855 if I round to four places. Both of those values agree with what we got by hand. So it still tells me do not reject the null hypothesis. So again, regardless of whether I use the classical approach or the p-value approach, whether I do the calculations by hand or I let the calculator or stat crunch determine them for me, I still get the same conclusion. Do not reject the null hypothesis. So we could also do the calculations for the hypothesis test using stat crunch. We could go to stat and t-stats, one sample, and in this case we have summary information. So then I just fill in this information. So we have a sample mean of 485, a sample standard deviation of 116, a sample size of 100. We're doing a hypothesis test. So our null hypothesis is that mu equals 501, and our alternative hypothesis would be that mu is less than 501. So if we select Compute, then here StatCrunch returns the test statistic, which is negative 1.379. That agrees with the results we obtained by hand and the results we obtained on the calculator. And it gives us a p-value, which is 0 0.0855, which also agrees with both our by hand computation and the calculator computation. So, do these results suggest that students who learn English as well as another language simultaneously score worse on the SAT critical reading exam? The answer to that question is no. At the .05 level of significance, it does not appear that students who learn English as well as another language simultaneously score worse on the SAT. The fact that we got a 485 in this particular sample is not statistically significant. So as far as we can tell, students who learn English as well as another language simultaneously do just as well as the general population of test takers.